Praise the Lord, everybody. I am Pastor Anthony L. Walker coming to you from Transformation Ministries located at 115 Coffee Avenue in Fayetteville, Georgia. So good to be with you one more time. And as always, I'd like to direct you to Transformation Ministries webpage, which is tm-church.com. And you go there and you can find out all you need to know about Transformation Ministries. You can go to the video menu to find uh, it will take you or direct you to the web page, the Renewing Your Mind web page, web page or YouTube channel is what I mean to say. And that way you can look at the messages, the previous messages, video messages that I have put out there on that channel. I also like to let people know that we are a teaching ministry because I really want people to get it. I want you to have knowledge and have understanding. And so people perish for a lack of knowledge. So I don't want you to have a lack of a lack of knowledge or understanding. So here at Transformation Ministries, there are three things that I want you to know that I want you to get from these messages that I pre present each week. And that is what the Bible says, what the Bible means, and also how you can apply that to your life. So I have a good message for you today. So before we get into it, let us pray for this service as well as the message itself. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for another opportunity to come together, Lord God, that your presence be with us no matter where we are because you are omnipresent. I pray that you uh, be here in our ministry and the live streaming here, that you will be with who's ever watching, Lord God, that your presence will be with them there, Lord. And we do this, Lord God, because we want to know more about you and the things of God. We want to know how to, um, to live a life, Lord God, uh, with you at, in, in charge of our life, Father. And so I ask that you be with us today and help people to tune in and stay tuned in so that they can receive the message that you have provided for today. And Lord God, is to give you glory and to, uh, we do this for the building of your kingdom, Lord God, that we may grow and learn together. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. So the message title today is fear God, not man. Fear God, not man. So I'm going to open this message with a disturbing social media posting from an atheist who is voicing their take on people fearing God. She's going to, I assume it's a she, I really couldn't tell from the message itself, but I think it's a, a female, but it doesn't even matter whether it's male or female because they are, it's what they are saying is what important to know and what we find disturbing. And I'm also going to provide you in addition to that posting or a couple of responses that people have. There were many responses, but I'm, for the sake of time, and this is not my main topic, but I'm going to present what other people have, uh, how they responded to this person's post. And this, I have it on the monitor, but this is the posting. I'm going to read it. I didn't go to try to correct anything that was said. I just uh, put it out there the way I saw it. And it states, I was born and raised atheist. I have never known a life with religion. My mom is a hardcore atheist and she raised me to be one too. That said, I don't know much about life with religion besides things I have read, watched, and have been told. So I've always heard the phrase God fearing Christian and religious people frame it as a good thing. I never thought too deep on it till now. But do people legitimately sit around fearing God? Do they genuinely feel afraid of him? I thought God and Jesus were supposed to be loving of their children. They basically are saying God and Jesus love you conditionally, and I will ruin you if you stray from their path. And it says, if this were between a kid and their parent, it would be considered emotional abuse. There's just so much wrong with religion that feels glaringly obvious. Yet these people don't think deeper than surface level about it. I would just never understand it. Now, that was that person's post. 
And clearly they're an atheist, so you know what their their view and their take on God is. But then the following, a couple of people have made other comments uh, as a response to that posting. And here's one that says, yeah, religious people are totally effed up. From the day they are born, they are taught to fear something that does not exist. Must have been a psycho to dream that scam up. And then another response to the post was this. Is there any other reason they would believe? They are scared of a world they can't understand. Scared they will end up in hell and scared of the vengeful, narcissistic, hypocrite that lives in the sky and likes to give kids cancer. So it is obvious to me that these folks have no fear of God based off their comments. And they're not very educated on the things of God either. Um, they do not even believe that God exists. So my thing is, why would they be mocking a God that they say is not real? That doesn't sound, that don't make sense in itself either. And then they attack the people who do fear him. So let's take it to a scripture in Romans chapter three, verse 10 through 18. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an opening sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is so true. This statement has always been true with atheists, <clears throat> as well as all sinners who oppose Christ. This is just the way they think. Their mindset is that. This is apparent in, in how this world openly and boldly deny and defy God and the things of God. They, they're open about it and they're bold with it because. They don't they know or they believe that they can get away with it, but no, they get away with nothing. There will be a time of reckoning for all of them. So the love uh, they love what um, God hates. But what about what God hates? What about what he hates? Do we know what God even hates? These, these atheists, they they love what God hates. It's just part of their nature. I'm not saying that all atheists are bad people. But they are definitely bad Christians. They're bad believers because they're unbelievers. You know, you can be good, but just being good is not going to get you into heaven. They don't believe in heaven in the way, right? They don't believe. But, you know, I, I'm going to deviate from my message. I met a guy once uh, in church. And he was like this in the service. All unfolded, not into it, dressed goth like, you know, gothic and all dark. And. I asked the Lord, I said, give me something to say to this young man. Help me to reach him. And so I walk over there um, and I sit by him and I said, hey, how you doing? I said, I'm Brother Walker. I wasn't a pastor at that time. I said, I'm Brother Walker. He said, what? I said, what's your name? He told me his name. And I said, you seem like you're not into any of this. He said, I'm not. I said, you're not into the service? He said, no. I said, but you're into God, right? No. I said, you believe in God, right? He said, no. And I said, are you crazy or are you just <laughs> stupid or what? And he started laughing. I asked God to give me something to say to break the ice, and that's what he gave me. And so he started laughing. I started laughing. And I said, so what do you believe in then? You don't believe in God. He said, I believe in science. I said, why do you believe in science? He said, because there's books and documentaries and, and, and writings that prove that that science is real and you got to have proof that something is real. And I said, okay, so you believe in science. I said, what about the devil? You believe in the devil? He said, yes, I believe in the devil. I said, what? You believe in the devil? Wait a minute, you believe in the science and you believe in the devil. 
but you don't believe in God. I said, why do you believe in the devil? He said, there's books and documentaries and writings that prove that the devil is real. I said, you know what? I said, you like to read? He said, I love to read. I said, it's dependent on what you're reading. I said, what you read and what you seek after, that's what you're going to receive. And that's what you're going to know. So you, you've read and researched things about the devil. He said, I have. I said, have you researched things about God? He said, no, I haven't. I said, there are the books and documentaries and writings about God. And if you seek that, then you will see who God is and get to know some of what uh, God represents and who he is. And so what happened, I asked him, I wrote a book called Transformation, Living a Christian Life. And I was going to minister to this guy, give him a Bible, said I asked if I could do it. And he said, yes. He said, I could, but he said, but I'm leaving, going back to Colorado. He's going out of town. He said, I'm leaving tomorrow. I said, if I give you the book, will you read it? He said, yes, he would. So some months have passed and his, this, this guy's father went to the church I was a member of. And he said, hey, my son's coming back for Christmas. And he said, he's going to come to the to church with me. And so doing church service, I didn't see him. I didn't see him at all. Church ended, I didn't see him. And so uh, when I was getting ready to leave, I saw his dad. He was standing up and his arms stretched and he was praising God um, in the aisles by the pew. And I went back there to, to uh, say hey to him. I didn't see his son. And when I got to where he was standing, I looked down in the pews and there was his son on his knees. and He was praying. Amen. And so. I said, hey, I said, I called him by his name. I said, hey, good to see you. He said, Brother Walker, he got up and he gave me a hug. I said, what were you doing? He said, I was praying. I said, who were you praying to? <laughs> he said, I was praying to God. I said, the God you don't believe? He said, no, I believe in God now. I said, what changed your mind? He said, I read your book. I got a lump in my throat <laughs> because it touched me to let him know that because he read something that was about God. And that's all he needed. And that's what a lot of people need. These people who are atheists, they need to not go by these people who are false teachers and, and go by what they're saying. They need to study to show themselves approved, a workman um, <clears throat> that, that need to not be ashamed and rightly divide the word of truth. <clears throat> they need to get into it for themselves and not depend on other people. And if, if they are so hardcore on on what they know, let them know it before they judge it. So let me get back to the message here, because I said that these people, they they love what God hates and, and they hate what God loves. OK, so but I want to bring up this scripture in Proverbs chapter six, uh, verse 16 through 19. It says, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven or an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that divisive wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So we as Christian believers, we must learn to love what God loves, not love what God hates or hate what God loves. We need to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Mm -hmm. Those things I read in Proverbs 6, chapter 6, we need to hate those things because God hates those things. We must learn to love, to fear God and not man. Uh, the sad thing is that it's becoming increasingly true that many professing Christians, many people who say that they're believers of God or followers of Jesus these days, they do not truly fear God themselves. But instead, who do they fear? They fear man. And God said, fear him, not man. Uh, the, they worry about what man thinks about them and about what they do. So if somebody got to come in about what you do or going to make a, give you their opinion of you or what they think about you, and then you want to cater to them because you fear that they're going to reject you or they're not going to include you in the in crowd or whatever, you need to worry about what God thinks about you. And this may be partly because many pastors avoid talking about 
anything that gives people a reason to fear God or truly understand him for that matter. So you got people up there, you got these people in the pulpit. They, they um, need me to ask this question because when they're up there preaching, are they really talking about, do they ever talk about sin? Is anybody even talking about sin these days? Are they talking about hell? Are they speaking about condemnation anymore? Not really. They're, I could also include holiness and wrath and judgment. Put that on the list. Are people even talking about those things? They're talking about prosperity. They're talking about counting your blessings. They're talking about how God's going to uh, elevate you. It's all about you. It's all about you. You're not trying to get into your heaven. You're trying to get into God's heaven. So it has to be about God. No one wants to hear, though, about a God who hates sin because people are in sin. And so nobody wants to hear that what they're doing, that God hates it. People only wants to hear about uh, God loving you, about God forgiving you, uh, about God prospering you. That's what people want to hear. That's what the itchy ears flock to the churches with the large congregation to hear how much God loves you. And there are pastors saying, well, people know that they're in, that they're bad. And, and no, they don't. People don't know that they're bad. We got to let them know that if, we, if the Bible was their mirror, they would see how bad they are. And we need to let them know that. No, you're, you're heading down the wrong path. We got to tell them the truth to put them on the right path. People, they do not know God, so they do not fear him because they don't know him. They do not know the God of scripture because they're not reading their Bible. How can you know the God of scripture if you're not getting into the word? How can you know the God of scripture is the church that you go to, the pastor's not getting into the word. So you need to make sure that if you're going to a church, that they're a Bible teaching, Bible toting, Bible preaching organization, that the, that everybody knows the Bible, that they're teaching the Bible. Without knowledge, people will perish. God knew that this would be an issue with men, with all mankind. God already knew it. He makes mention of it through uh, the problem with in, within the scriptures itself. Uh, it is obvious that man will fear man. And, and like I said, because men worry about what men think about them. But God tells us that we are to fear him and not man. Fear God, not man. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So people, yes, people worry about people who are able to destroy them, to destroy their flesh. But that's not what you need to worry about. You need to worry about the one who can destroy your flesh and also destroy your soul. And then the scripture says in hell. So that's who we, that's what we need to fear. And a parallel gospel account to this teaching can be found in Luke chapter 12, verse four and five. And it's, it reads similar. It says, and I say unto you, my friend, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Man can't cast you into hell. Only God can do that. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And then I hear people say that, like the atheist was saying, you know, about talking about the babies with cancer or people going to hell. What kind of loving God will send a person to hell? God is not sending anyone to hell. You're already on your way there because you come into this world with sin. But what God has done is giving you a way out through his son, Jesus Christ. When God manifested himself in flesh and became that human sacrifice. That, that that sacrificial lamb to shed his blood and 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 give his life the uh, for the to pay your sin debt you know because he did that he opened a way but just because he did that there's even a part that you have you know people say that we're saved uh by grace through faith where the through faith part that means you have a part in this 
And your faith is, is being under, uh, be a follower of Christ. Uh, that means you're going to obey his commandments. That means those things that he hates, you're going to hate now. Those things that he loves, you're going to love now. So you have a part in that. You can't just name it and claim it. You got to live it. You got to walk it. It has to be your way of living. If you want to make it there because you're not trying to get into your own kind of heaven. I said it earlier. You're trying to get into God's heaven. And their rules, their requirements. Death of the body is not the worst fate you can face. Some people might find that hard to believe. And what can be worse than death? It is not the ultimate loss. Talking about death. It's not the ultimate loss. The ultimate loss is death of the body and the soul together in hell. Fear not those who can kill the body. Uh, but not the soul. Don't fear them, but fear the one who can kill both body and soul in hell. Jesus warned his apostles before sending them out. He uh, said that they would face persecution and hatred and they would come from the Jewish religious leaders and the Gentiles authorities as they proclaim his truth. So they are out there and they're, they're spreading the gospel and those religious leaders, those Jewish leaders, and those Gentiles, those people who were not followers of Christ, in, in the sense, the whole world, besides other fellow Christian believers, they're going to come against you and they're going to hate you because of what you're representing, because of who you're representing and what you're presenting. So he urged them not to respond with mis misplaced fear. Don't respond back to them with that because of their, these people's authority. So don't respond with misplaced fear um, uh, in authority, but with proper fear of the Lord. Now, that's the fear that you are to respond with. Now, we're going to get into this a little more. Fear of the Lord is not intended to be um, that of terror or panic. Like those atheists, when they was talking at the beginning, when I was reading, talking about that we are afraid and we're scared. No, we're talking about a proper fear here. It's a healthy fear. Fear of the Lord is a healthy kind of fear, is a reverential fear of great and profound respect. So reverential, you're respecting God, and that's a reverential fear. That's a respectful fear because you respect God for who he is, Amen. not just for what he can do, but yes, he can do it. Uh, so it is also, um, it, it demands acknowledgement that God can destroy whoever opposes him. I mean, he's the one who created all. He can do whatever he want with all. But his loving kindness is to oppose those that come against his loving nature. Because we are in a sinful world. Satan, people are always blaming God when bad things happen. Do they ever blame Satan for the bad things that happen? Do they ever blame themselves for the bad, bad things that happen? You know, but everybody want to blame God. And why? Because they do not fear God. They do not respect God. God is the creator of all and he can do what he wants with that creation. The Lord giveth and taketh away, right? Yep, that's what they said in Job. But God answers to it all, to all this, all the fear and uh, these doubts that people have is salvation. Salvation through Jesus Christ who brings the, and promotes, uh, who brings a promise um, of eternal life to body and soul. So, I mean, he promotes this truth that you're going to have eternal life through um, uh, body and soul. So it's not just death. It's a promise of eternal life. Amen. Death is temporary. But then everybody's going to die once. But then those who are not followers, those who are not born again, let me put it this way. Those who are born twice will live for eternity. Those who will die twice mean they're going to have a physical death and a spiritual death, and that's it. They're not going to live forevermore. They're going to burn up, burn up in the lake of fire. They're going to be uh, eternally separated from God. Keep your fear for God. You have to retain it. The one who charged of the one in charge of life and death. <clears throat> God is in charge of life and death. 
and be encouraged. I'm asking, I'm saying that you should be encouraged because even when facing hatred, persecution, and death, your soul is ultimately in God's hand if you are a believer and follower of Christ Jesus. Like the early disciples, you live in a world that is increasingly hostile to Christian believers. You too are sent out to the unsaved world to share the gospel, not just the pastors, not just the missionaries, but each, each person who say that they are a follower of Christ, believer of Christ, you become a disciple of Christ. And as a disciple of Christ, you are to make more disciples. So you too, you need to know the gospel. How can you tell people about God if you don't know about God yourself? I, I've, I've talked to so many people or people have, let me put it this way, have come to me and say, I want you to talk to this person about God. And I'm, I'm, my job is to bring them to you. I said, no, your, your, God, your job is to talk to them about God. Don't you know about God? Well, I mean, but I'm not a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor. It, uh, it ain't just pastors that are going to be in heaven. In fact, a lot of them not going to be there. <laughs> I mean, it, it's up to those who, who follow Jesus. And not just belief, but in deeds, in their actions, in their beliefs, in their obedience, and all of that. So, you must respond with, to people with the fear of, not with the fear of the human authority, just like the disciples, we are to respond with the fear of the Lord. We're not to replace, misplace our fear through their authority, that we're afraid of them because of their position, because of their status in this world. We are to fear the Lord. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 through 18, it says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. So, yeah, so people, uh, you know, as when you're speaking for God, you're going to you're going to have to deal with men who's going to try to kill the body and who's going to try to kill your dreams, who's going to try to kill your your beliefs, all those things. But don't fear those guys. So I understand that it can be tempting to fear people who can kill your body, who wants to lose their who wants to lose their life. Nobody really wants to lose their life, but you're going to have to, you know, uh, as long as the Lord tarries, you know. But when the, the Lord returns, some people are going to be instantly changed, but that's going to be very few because we're talking like now. So people, they're afraid of what end time prophecies might say but your end time can be today your end time can be tomorrow we never know uh, if you're going to be in a car accident we never know if you're going to have an aneurysm we never know if you're going to have a heart attack we never know if you're going to be murdered so you never know what tomorrow brings so you need to be ready and you, and you should have fear all people who are non-believers need to fear the judgment but as a believer you are not to fear any of that Amen. Because you respect the Lord, you follow the Lord, and you're going to be with the Lord. So these kinds of fears, uh, what is fear such as losing your possessions, losing your friends, losing your reputation, people fear those things too because they fear man and what man is going to think. But these kind of fears can cause you to compromise with the world. The important thing is to remember that uh, being a follower of Jesus requires uh, going against the status quo. You're not going to have, you're going to be different. You're going to stand out. You're going to be a peculiar people different from everyone else in the world. You are in this world, but you're not of this world. In Romans 12, 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 17, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father, talking about Father God, is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Um, and when I say world, I'm talking about all the wickedness and evil and lust and, and profanity and vulgarness and, and just all downright wickedness. That's the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Those who do the will of God abideth forever. Only those who would do the will of the God of God will abide forever. So this entire message, and not just this scripture, but the entire message that, I, that I'm presenting today is about fearing God and not man. There's a saying that if someone or something puts the fear of God into you, then you have uh, they have frightened you or they have worried you. And so they make it they put it in a bad way as that you are just being scared and afraid. So scripture tells us that God has put a fear of himself into our hearts. Scripture tells us that. But it's not to go. It's not the same as the saying that with someone or something put the fear of God into you because now you're frightened and worried. And then God don't want you to be frightened and worried. God does not do this to frighten you. He don't try to worry you. He does this for an entirely different purpose. Jeremiah verse, chapter 32, verse 40, it says, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them. So God is not turning away from you. He's not leaving you or forsaking you. It says to them to do them good. He's not going to turn away from you. He's going to do, do you good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me, which is a good thing, which is a great thing. So the kind of fear that, that God puts in your heart helps you to draw closer to him. As a Christian, you do not have a groveling, cringing, or slave-like fear of the Lord. Rather, you have a reverential, a humble fear of the Lord. The gospel is the difference between being afraid of God and fearing God. That's two different things, to be afraid of God and to fear God. You are not to be scared of God. Believers have no reason to be scared of him. Amen to that? It is only when you come to fear the Lord that the Lord tells you to fear not. Does that make sense? It is when you fear the Lord, it's when he tells you to fear not. And what he's telling you for when you know that the love of God in Christ, the, uh, the spirit casts out all fear and it instills in you the love and adoration that you might work out your own salvation. And when I'm saying work out your own salvation, I mean, you're responsible for yourself being saved and you work that out with fear and trembling and worship of the Lord with reverence and awe. For who, because of who he is, the creator of all things, the creator of heaven and of earth, the Lord of lords and the king of kings. The one true God. For unbelievers, the fear of God is the fear of the judgment of God and eternal death, which is eternal separation from God. For the believers, the fear of God is something much different. The difference is the reverence of God. The re this reverence and all are exactly what the fear of God means for all Christians. Um, again, I'm not talking about something spooky or scary. I'm talking about respect. This is a motivating factor for you to surrender to your creator. Got two scriptures I want to go over in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. but fools despise wisdom and instruction. I'm going to say that again, but fools, F-O-O-L-S, despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And I said that at the beginning of my message that what I want you to get from this ministry is, and through the messages that I present is to have knowledge. 
and that you have understanding of that knowledge. You know what the Bible says, you know what the Bible means, and then you have the wisdom on how to apply that to your life. And that's the proper fear of the Lord. True wisdom comes only from the understanding who God is and that he is holy, he is just, and he is righteous. The fear of God is the basis for your walking in his ways, serving him and loving him. Until you understand who God is and develop a referential fear of him, you cannot have true wisdom. No matter how smart you think you are, you can't have godly wisdom. You might have worldly wisdom and worldly knowledge and worldly understanding, but you can't have it as spiritual knowledge and understanding and wisdom. That's at a whole nother level. That's at a God level. And while reverential fear is, is definitely included in the concept of feeling, fearing God, to have that respect for, for God, God, um, there is more than just respecting him. There's a lot more than that. A biblical fear of God includes understanding how much God hates sin and fearing his judgment on sin. So you're going to have that knowledge that God really, really, really hates sin. And remember I said hate what God hates and love what God loves. So you too should have a really, really, really hate towards sin. When you love God more, you're going to hate sin more. As a child, your fear and discipline from your parents hopefully prevented you from doing wrong because you fear punishment from your from your uh, parents. That don't mean you're afraid of your parents, but you fear the punishment that they can bring you. The same should be true in your relationship with God. You should fear his discipline and therefore seek to live your life in a way that pleases him. So while God's discipline is done in love, it may still be a fearful thing. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He hath feareth it. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So if you have that, if you're scared, then you're missing something, which is love. And God is love. The one who knows Christ in true fellowship lives for him and does not need to fear a future punishment. Because if you're living with Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you don't have to deal with that punishment. So you don't have a fear of that punishment. It's for the unbeliever to fear. The person who experienced fear has not been perfected in love. So if you're afraid of judgment, then you need to, to take a look at yourself and see if you're afraid of God or if you fear God. There's a difference. So in other words, those who fear punishment do not have a complete or mature relationship with God. Your fear of God is respecting him. It's obeying him. It's submitting to his uh, discipline and it's worshiping him in awe. When you grasp the vastness of God's majesty and holiness, you realize that you are but a finite being in the presence of an infinite God. His commands are not optional, but essential for living a righteous life. So everything that God put in there, people say that the, the Bible is a book of thou shalt not. Well, if you find yourself doing what thou shalt do, the good things, if you're doing the do, you won't have time to do the don'ts. So that's why you got to understand the Bible to love what God loves and hate what God hates. If you're busy loving the things that God loves, you're not going to have time to do the things that God hates. A healthy fear of God uh, nurtures a deeper intimacy that draws you closer to him. In this closeness, you recognize that you need his grace. You need his guidance and his presence in your life. Life is not about living in constant dread, but about being in God's will. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this message, Lord. I pray that uh, I've done justice in, in presenting the message. I pray that those 
uh, who have heard it uh, listen well to receive the word, to receive the message as intended. And if they find that something doesn't line up with their life, that they will make adjustment to it, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that they will seek your face and they will pray to you, Lord God, to try to understand you better, to get into your word so that they can know you better through the scripture, that they can know themselves better through scripture. And I pray, Lord God, that they will know that it is vital that they fear you and not man. So Lord God, give them the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to, to take on this new walk, to walk in, in uh, truth and newness of life through Christ Jesus, Lord God, so that they will not have to fear judgment. They can look forward to eternity with their creator, their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you all for tuning in. I like to uh, send an invitation that if you're in the Fairview area, I don't mind traveling to the Fairview area. Please come fellowship and worship with us and praise God and learn. And let's just just have a good time in the Lord uh, at, here at 115 Cothy Avenue, K-A-T-H-I Avenue in Fairview, Georgia. Uh, whether you live here or don't mind traveling here, you are welcome and we welcome you with love. And so also we'd like to ask if you don't mind or would like to sow into the things of God that are happening through Transformation Ministry to help us reach more people and to cater to the needs of more people, uh, then feel free to uh, to to give in or sow into this ministry. You can do that. We have a cash app, which is dollar sign transformed life. That's dollar sign transformed life. Or you may mail it to uh, 115 Cotty Avenue, or you can also use PayPal, which is paypal.me uh, forward slash transformation, M-I-N. And so, uh, but we'd like to see you in person and you can bring it and sow it into the offering. You know, so it's, it's good to be with you again. And, and I just want to say, uh, God bless you. And until we meet again, just walk in newness, walk in life and fear the Lord, which is a good thing. Amen. Thank you all for joining in.